Big news today in the Low Country. One of my favorite lawyers down there has filed a new suit in the Court of Common Pleas in Hampton County, and you're not going to believe who it's against. Are you ready? Let's get started. This is Legal Updates with Cassidy. Mark Tinsley files suit against Will Folks and Fitz News. Welcome. The case is a defamation case that's centered around a young man by the name of Austin Stanley and the defendants, Fitz News and Will Folks. And what's it about? We see our first clue in point four, reputational harm. And then we see the first cause of action, defamation. Mark really lets him have it in point six. It says Fitz News is a news organization, in quotes, which many refer to as a tabloid because it monetizes and traffics in salacious stories to gain followers and viewership across multiple platforms, including its website, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Furthermore, Fitz News and folks tweet and otherwise post provocative headlines as clickbait to attract attention and promote their content. And as some of you may have seen in my comment section, I unsubscribed when he published an accusation against Creighton Waters, claiming that a normal attorney witness session was some kind of covert prep session to guide Becky Hill through her testimony. He was alluding that it was something inappropriate. And it was really interesting to me that it was almost verbatim what Dick Harpootlian said. I was so happy when at the hearing, Justice Toll shut that right down, saying this is normal. Because before a hearing or a trial, it is normal for attorneys to meet with their witnesses. There was nothing wrong with it. There was nothing improper, nothing like what he accused. It was nothing but sensationalism. The tongue lashing continues in point seven. Fitz News stands for First in the South, which exemplifies the defendant's financial goal of being first to break stories rather than taking time to verify the accuracy of information before releasing it and refusing to consider the long-term implications of the extended reach and permanence of the publications they make. And this is such a good point. I saw someone make this comment on X, formerly known as Twitter. I wish they would just go back to being called Twitter, because X just sounds so silly. But anyway, as one commenter said, everyone sees the initial lie. Few see the retraction. The damage has been done. Take them down. And this is the sad truth. Once it's out there, it's permanent. You can't take it back. And now we get to the meat of what happened in points 8 and 9. On or about April 1st, 2023, the defendants published an article identifying people that Fitz News contended were somehow involved in the murder of Stephen Smith, a 19-year-old gay man who was found dead in the middle of Sandy Run Road in Crockettville, South Carolina on July 8th, 2015. And I just wonder how many people are going to be accused of this murder before someone is finally convicted. They've already gone through this with Buster, and now we have this happening yet again. Point 9 goes on. In the article and accompanying video, defendants published a photograph of two people defendants claimed were prime suspects in the murder of Stephen Smith. And now we see that right here. The photograph of the individual on the right-hand side of the photo is Austin Stanley, and he is the plaintiff. He had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the death of Stephen Smith. He has never been a suspect, never been a person of interest, never been linked to the death of Smith in any way outside of Fitz News. So how do we get here from there? Point 11 tells us that when these false statements were first made about this plaintiff and this photograph was published, Stanley's mother repeatedly emailed folks and Fitz News to let them know they'd made a mistake. Again, saying that he has not and will never be a suspect, nor has law enforcement ever named him as a suspect. A few days later, on April 4th, after these false statements have been broadcast and published for days, folks responded. And here we see the email. He says, Hey there, I did receive your messages. Apologize for the late response. As soon as we received your initial message, I instructed my staff to remove the photo you referenced from the YouTube video. This was done Sunday, I believe. 
happy to issue a clarification, correction, or take any other action you feel is appropriate. Also, this is my direct email address. Please feel free to reach me here anytime. Thank you, W. Interesting that he apologizes for the late response, but he never apologizes for having posted her son as a murder suspect. Days after this young man's face was all over his website and his social media, no apology. Just this cold, hey there, can't even address her by her name. But it doesn't end there. Now we look at point 13. Nonetheless, on October 9th, so months later, despite their acknowledgement about their false statements, defendants published another story, again indicating that the plaintiff was a person of interest in the murder of Stephen Smith and put his photograph next to the words, Prime Suspects. Again, this is on his website, this is on YouTube, this was on X. As we see here, there's his face, plain as day. And you know, a lot of people quote from Fitz News. They run their own videos, they run their own news stories. So who knows how many times this picture was actually circulated. And maybe those sources never saw the retraction. He then points out that this video has been seen at least 151,000 times. And that's here in point 15. We all know Hampton is a small town and that the Stephen Smith case is a very well-known case in that area. Naturally, the people who've seen this story have remarked about it to Stanley, his family, his friends, and others about his involvement in this murder. And it goes on to say that in the YouTube video, folks goes to great lengths to explain how seriously they take calling someone a person of interest, implying that means the suspect or a person of interest was in fact involved in the death of Stephen Smith. At the end of point 16, these statements or insinuations cast plaintiff in a false light and were defamatory per se. Defendants and their agents, servants, and employees actually knew of the falsity of the statements when they were made for financial gain. And we know that because we just saw the email back in April. You would think that after having found this out, they would have destroyed that picture so that it could never accidentally have been used again. Point 17 points out that it was reckless disregard for the truth. And as I said earlier, published to multiple third parties. 18 calls it actual malice because of the knowledge of the falsity of these statements about plaintiff and reckless disregard for the truth by the defendants. Further, the statements were malicious, non-privileged, and false, and were published and made negligently, recklessly, or with an intent to injure plaintiff's reputation and destroy his good name. So 19 shows the ways that Austin Stanley has suffered. We can imagine embarrassment, worryation, injury, and in the future will continue to suffer such harm and injury. And that's true. Anyone who saw that article and knows him or sees him, and just the, his thoughts of what people might be thinking, that's very real too. Those are the kinds of things that make people prisoners of their own minds, scared to go out for what people might look at them and think. So indeed, he has suffered great pain, suffering, mental anguish, emotional distress, anxiety, humiliation, and frustration. His reputation and standing in the community have been damaged. Point 20, because of the defendant's conduct, plaintiff is entitled to an award of actual and punitive damages to be determined by the jury. And then we get to our second cause of action, which is negligence. Point 22, defendant's owed the plaintiff or undertook a duty of due care to protect the plaintiff from improper and false allegations by the defendants or their agents, servants, or employees. This duty included the duty to properly train and supervise its employees and verify the information before they published or broadcast it. Sometimes accidents are made in reporting and there is no malice behind it. However, when you are going to accuse someone of being a prime suspect in murder, you better check that 30 times, not just three times. This has to be verified. It's not a simple mess up of a date or a small insignificant fact. This is an accusation of murder. 23 goes on to say that they were negligent, grossly negligent, reckless, willful, and wanton. And then it lists A through L of 
all the ways that they were negligent. A. Failing to adequately supervise and review its personnel to ensure that they were carrying out their responsibilities in a reasonable fashion to not make false reports. This is why newspapers and news agencies have editors to make sure this doesn't happen. If you're going to call yourself a news agency, you have a huge responsibility to get these kinds of things right. And that's in direct harmony with part B. They failed to establish proofreaders or copy editors or to employ an editing protocol to prevent the improper use of photographs and the publication of false or misleading information. C. Failing to recognize that private people have a greater right to control information about themselves than public figures and failing to weigh the consequences of publishing or broadcasting false personal information. This young man is not a public figure. You have to take care when writing about private people. D. Failing to properly train its employees. E. <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry to giggle. I giggle every time I read it. I thought I was I had my giggles out. In pandering to lurid curiosity. And there's been so much of that lately, of going beyond the necessary information in these things, filing FOIA requests, getting people's personal email, putting it out there in the middle of an investigation for people to read without context, lurid curiosity, unnecessary. F, failing to consider the long-term implications of the extended reach and permanence of a false publication. We've all heard the saying, the internet is forever. G, in unreasonably making a false statement about or accusing plaintiff of being a person of interest in the death of Stephen Smith. H, failing to verify information before releasing it. I, failing to institute proper policies and procedures to protect innocent people like the plaintiff. Or, if such policies and procedures existed, in failing to follow and abide by such policies and procedures that would have prevented the false publication of plaintiff's photograph. J. In making such publications in utter and complete disregard for the rights of the plaintiff or the harm he would suffer. Last two, K. In failing to exercise that degree of care which a reasonable, prudent journalist would have exercised under the same or similar circumstances. L. In such other and further particulars as the evidence in trial may show. 24 again emphasizes the suffering that he's endured because of these things. Embarrassment, great harm, worry, injury, mental anguish, emotional distress, anxiety, humiliation, and frustration. And you can just imagine if your face was placed out there as a prime suspect in a well-known murder, you would feel all of these things. So 25, because of defendant's conduct, plaintiff is entitled to an award of actual and punitive damages. He then requests a jury trial and judgment against defendants for actual and punitive damages, costs and expenses associated with having to litigate this cause of action, and further relief as the court might deem just and proper. And this is signed by Mark Tinsley, his own law firm, and additionally, the law office of Brendan J. Green from Columbia. I'm so glad this young man has Tiger Tinsley on his side. I will definitely be keeping tabs on this story, and I'm very curious to see who Fitz News is going to hire to defend them. Until then, this is Cassidy O'Connell saying stay well and stay tuned. <laughs>